Welcome to the Heart of Soul podcast, an exploration of who you are, what you are, and why you are, offering new ways to investigate age-old questions at the heart of you. Hi, it's Joseph, and thanks for listening to the Heart of Soul podcast. In today's episode, we do a deep dive into sagehood and the differing metaphysical assumptions between traditional Zen and identity's take on mental body ensoulment. Especially important is how identity's take on healing the fear of not being allows for an integration of the impersonal realm traditionally owned by Zen with the personal world of the human. I remind you, as always, to please listen to this podcast from the beginning and in order. Thanks so much for listening. Well, greetings, everybody, and welcome back to, uh, welcome forward, excuse me, to another episode of The Heart of Soul. Thanks for being here, Stace. We are going to be talking about sagehood in some deeper ways. Where should we begin today? Well, um, maybe to start with um, um, bears uh, some restressing uh, some of the things we've talked about in earlier podcasts and how identity looks at the whole ancient track of uh, non-dual or trans-dual based enlightenment, uh, first in Hinduism and then in Buddhism, and completely recalibrates it uh, to a, an entirely different interpretation of the particular data <laughs> that occurs in uh, non-dual enlightenment. We're going to reinterpret the data, uh, and uh, that will lead to a new integration of um, sainthood and sagehood that has never before been articulated, um, much less based metaphysically without, without um, contradiction, principles that flow from the metaphysics and then the Dharma that flows from the principles. Uh, essence, form and expression changes. When we look at what's been called Satori um, or in Hinduism, Samadhi uh, uh, in an entirely different light. Um, so we'll go from, that's what we're going to do today that's the starting out place uh, to define. And in that sense, um, uh, identity, as we've spoken about maybe tangentially in other uh, podcasts, Joseph, um, uh, how much identity is inclu inclusive rather than exclusive. It finds a way, because based in emotivity of consciousness, it finds a way to integrate psychology, philosophy, Eastern spirituality and Western spirituality, um, all without dissonance or without metaphysical um, collisions. And so in, in that bigger context, um, sagehood becomes an ex a completely different process, a completely different um, interpretive process than the one usually handled by a satguru or uh, some, some meditation leader, or um, even if the meditation leader isn't even, um, isn't even enlightened yet. Uh, which there's a lot of those out there in the West. Sure. Uh, so uh, what I want to say first is um, uh, there's a way of a phrase that um, goes right to the point of the differences between sagehood, pre non-dual based sagehood, and what's been usually called or referred to as the sainthood path of a, a soul's um, relationship with divinity, it's, it's uh, prog uh, we're progeny of divinity. Um, but there's a phrase that's um, where one word really makes the distinction between the two, sainthood and sagehood, but um, also uh, integrates them. And uh, for sagehood, for non-dual based sagehood, um, I could say, and this phrase came to me um, after my own event, um, Let's see if I can remember. Yeah. Uh, each moment, the day pours itself into me and gives me a, a world to live as. Hmm. I'll say that again. It bears repeating. E each moment, the day pours itself into me and gives me a world to live as. This directly um, uh, relates to the Buddha's um, picture of things that um, says there's no difference between experience and the experiencer. So whereas in sainthood, and I'll come back to this in a moment, um, the phrase would be each moment the day pours itself into me and gives me a world to live in. 
Uh -huh. You see the distinction there? Mm -hmm. That's There's an experiencer right. and a, an experience in the sainthood version. Exactly right. That difference between in and as uh, is big enough to drive a paradigm through. Um, and uh, that, that distinction is really important um, because after Satori or after what's been called non-dual enlightenment that we call, of course, mental body and soulment, um, uh, but there's no central I in the same way there was before, a sense of I that drives choices um, is one way to put it. In other words, the day unfolds and tells you uh, what, what, what's, who you are or what you are or what you're going to do. Um, when um, when uh, uh, Dafri John, I always forget his, he had seven or eight names before he passed. Uh, Adida uh, was the last Adida, name. Adida, yes. Adida is, um, is, is his last more poetic one, uh, as we spoke to uh, at some point. In the, in Franklin the Jones and, was his original yeah, name. Franklin Jones, right. Yeah. Yeah. But when someone asked him what the secret of enlightenment was, of course, he, he put up one finger. Uh, and that everyone thought, oh, well, that's the one thing. Um, uh, and uh, and it wasn't the one thing; it was the eye he was he was showing there, uh, that there that the eye is the fulcrum um, that decides and opts and chooses and reacts and reacts. And when you take away that eye, um, then an entirely different uh, mode of consciousness kicks in, where you're not the driver, but experience is the driver. So that's why, for me, that sentence that came out of me, um, each moment of the day pours itself into me and uh, gives me a world to live as. It's unfolding without an I agent to the degree that the I agent was there before. And that's a fundamental premise in identity's sagehood path is that it's not that the I was an illusion all these centuries or, or, or uh, millennia. It's that that that, it, that we were over attached to it in other words the mental body as they say in their own metaphysics when they have metaphysics um, uh, to a te to their teaching um, uh, uh, the eye is a, is a complete illusion of the way the mind um, uh, um, affects experience dualistic experience creating an inner dualistic eye as representative of, or whose parent is actually experience uh, that that I, and it's an illusion, and of course uh, uh, the Buddha never never took that as we've said in an earlier podcast. I think the Buddha never took that track. He never said the I was an illusion. He simply said there's no difference between the experiencer and the ex and experience. He didn't even use the word the the phrases non duality. Um, mm -hmm. They uh, and, and I forget what the uh, term is in uh, in in uh, in Sanskrit or Hindi uh, Hindu. But um, <clears throat> uh, in, in identity follows this track here in that it's slavery to the I that is created by cathection of dualistic experience. It's slavery to that that's the issue in enlightenment, not the illusoriness of it. And it's that was old... that was built into the um, the cause of suffering being uh, attachment and over identification. The Buddha did teach that, you know. It it did, he did. Um, but it only when it moved to China and Japan uh, following uh, did the analytics in the um, metaphysical theory of things get kind of twisted up here, and that's largely what survives to the day to the to present day is these twists that. Um, the movement to uh, Chinese uh, intellect is extremely um, focused and analytical and precise. J uh, Japanese, uh, not quite as much, but it's a little more, uh, they're a little more emotional than the Chinese um, that way. And so there's a little softer version of that. But still, oh, it depends, of course, on the teacher. It's, it's, that's a generalization. Uh, we don't see any racism. Uh, <laughs> we see cultural uh, effects of uh, unconsciousness, but not racial. Mm -hmm. um, so the point here is that um, identity, uh, if, there, if, if even the Buddha did not go so far to say that the I was 100% illusory, um, he, he, he never offered um, uh, uh, metaphysics to his teaching. Uh, he just offered experience. 
and the uh, the walking enlightenment uh, uh, style uh, that um, that answers every question without having to go into an analytics, which uh, are a product of the mental body anyway. You see, yeah. so an over <laughs> an over reliance on analytics is also part of being too much a slave of the mental body. So these are important um, ways of discerning identity's picture of things. Um, and in that sense, uh, identity's personhood track um, asks the question, who am I? Um, uh, the sagehood track, what am I? We'll get to that a little bit more heartfelt in a moment. What am I? And the, um, the sainthood path uh, lives into the question, why am I? So in the sagehood uh, track, we're looking at what am I? Um, and uh, for, uh, for personhood in who am I, there's a little triad that I like to uh, summarize. Personhood is the Dharma is feel, reveal, and heal. Uh, that's the triad that uh, personhood's based on. Um, the, um, the triad that uh, sagehood is based on in identity is don't attach, don't resist, and don't consist. Does that make sense oh, uh, to you? Don't. What was it? Say, say that one more time. Don't attach. Don't. Don't, don't attach. Don't. don't resist. And don't don't consist. Not persist. Um, I say consist because it's a one step deeper than persist. Um, because you have to consist before you can persist. You have to be consistent. You have to oh. consist of something. Oh, like you substantive. Uh -huh. yeah. Substantive. Substantively. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right. And for sainthood, it's a dream, trust, and attract at the human level uh, anyway. So uh, focusing on this don't attach, don't resist, don't consist. Um, the last one is the hardest. Uh, you have to learn how to uh, not attach. Uh, and not resist, which are the same problem in uh, in, in, saint, in true sagehood. Uh, people think they're two different things, opposite ends of the rainbow, but they're exactly the same uh, uh, impediment to um, enlightenment. And that is you don't attach to anything and you don't resist to anything. It's the, ro the stone rolls down the hill, but it gathers no moss either way. It, uh, it doesn't stop uh, it isn't stopped by the trees rolling down. It goes right through them. Uh, and it doesn't resist go by going around the trees. It goes in a straight line. Uh, in turn, the straight line being a metaphor for holding the focus to the ultimate background, um, which is the, the non-dual, which we would agree with in that way. Um, but uh, when you reframe, as we'll get to a little more in a moment, the non-dual to pre-dual, then there is an, a new ultimate background um, um, out of which all, uh, all existence uh, and creation uh, arises now and now and now and now. I was, I'm, was working, i use a personal uh, experience here. I was wor I'm working currently with a woman um, uh, uh, here in the town I live in and uh, who asked me um, if I would uh, personally tutor her in, um, in, in uh, enlightenment practice. Um, and so she's got her own uh, tabletop guru, uh, even though I'm not a guru. Uh, I'm just a human being who's attained some certain um, uh, levels of consciousness that seem, people seem to want and want to know more about. And uh, she was telling, I told her originally when we started this, because she also has third eye um, uh, intuitive gifts uh, which is under the sainthood banner in identity, of course, because it's uh, it's not nothing, not no thing. It's an actual thing, thing, even it's though not, it's not a yeah, not contentless. Yeah, exactly, not contentless. Mm -hmm. um, and she said that I told her that uh, likely, if a person has third eye um, capacities, as we zone in on the central focus of of pre duality, non duality, pre dual non duality, it's going to enhance. Um, third eye capacities and enhance by itself uh, certain gifts you may have in your access to divinity, uh, that whole relationship you have with divinity. And so she was, she was showering recently and she told me that she could see, she started the last few weeks uh, to see behind the shower's spigot and the, sh and the wall of the shower, 
to the vastness background behind it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I told her, well, you can see there's there's your third eye activating to the next level, peeling that onion at the same time without even trying, just by seeking the, the, the non-dual track, um, seeking it non-seekingly. We'll get to that too, I hope. That's the uh, third and, eye thing, seeing the the canvas yeah. behind duality, the third eye does that? I never really... No, um, uh, let me complete. Okay. Uh, uh, the, be- the most she could get is this vastness uh, behind it, but the vastness was not empty. It was kind of pulsating with oh, um, yeah, that would be third eye. energetics yeah. and all that. And I and I, re- I reflected back to her. Uh, she thought that was the ultimate background. As she many still, people do. And they stop there. Yes. Do. Exactly right. And I said, there's, a, there's an actual background to the background. Uh-huh. Um, and that is this pre-dual, non-dual, um, white canvas upon which all energy and matter is painted. And that's that like sense, seeing the primer coat, but not the wall. <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> exactly. Oh, you, you, you and your metaphors. But uh, so that was really uh, compelling to her. And as soon as I, I said that, she she made a, a, a really, you know, ooh, fake kind of face. That's how you know. <laughs> yes, uh, huh. because uh, and I pointed out to her, I, I stopped her right there. There, there, that feeling that you just mm. had. Um, why do you do that? She goes, well, the, the vastness behind makes me go, oh, yeah. Uh-huh. But the thing behind the, all the vastness makes me go, ooh, it frightens me. And uh, there was a perfect lesson for the day that she got an emotional, um, uh, she had an emotional reaction in reaction to uh, not existing uh, yeah. in the way that she's accustomed to existing as an I. So these kinds of things happen Um I'm, uh, I'll talk about it at the end of the, today's podcast about a new um, um, baking mechanism to take people on, the, on, a, on a pre-dual path. I'd like mm-hmm. to describe that at the end here. So in that sense, um, what we're talking about in, um, in, in identity's sagehood path is that we're actually and directly trying to give you an experience of your state dependency. Ah, uh-huh. right. It's a really um, this is a nice, softer kind of thing uh, um, that's a little different uh, taste and experience than uh, just saying, well, the pre-dual and the non-dual is the ultimate canvas uh, out of which all duality arises. Um, yeah, it's not uh, really feelable. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. Um, but we're all state dependent, um, possessing this I to which then we overattach the one created by cathection of dualistic experience, so far so good. But um, it doesn't render that uh, illusory um, just because our eye consciousness is created by um, a dualistic experience doesn't mean it's an illusion any more than just because you may have confirmation bias doesn't mean you're not, doesn't mean you're not right. And just because um, you're paranoid doesn't mean that yes. people aren't coming to get you. <laughs> exactly right. So um, this one distinction, uh, uh, upon this one distinction, pivots everything in uh, in identity's uh, recalibration of what sagehood involves metaphysically. It's not about exposing the illusory nature. It's exposing the illusory emotional-based attachments we have to that I that was initially conditioned into us by dualistic experience now i don't imagine the buddha frame framed it as an emotional (laughs) thing because that was two thousand years before people cared much about emotions (laughs) that's exactly 2500 years 2500 years uh, 2464 i think if i remember right um at any rate um that's that's exactly right in fact no current zen or um or or uh um advaita vedanta a version of it would use that terminology or that picture of things that could be described in words in the first place. Um, it's our emotional over attachment to that I. Now that means if there's an emotional over attachment to that I, what's the source of that emotional over attachment? And that is our wounded, that the source of that is our wounded soulfulness. Mm. Right. Uh, um, there, the, remember, of course, it was we said many times um, uh, the Eastern path was uh, 
um, uh, um, begun in a pre-psychological era. Um, and so oh, we wanted to be motive for the Hindu ascetics at the time was simply to be liberated from the Maya of mass consciousness forms and expressions. Um, they wanted to be liberated and be uh, their own Sadhguru and and uh, become renowned and, and all this like uh, Krishna apparently was in their in their track. Um, but it was, it was all pre-psychological. And so this is an update um, of the Buddha's teaching relative not only to psychology, but a redefinition of psychology, that we are, our consciousness mm -hmm. is emotive, emotive based, um, not um, mental, physical, uh, or even energetic based. And that's what um, allows sagehood and personhood to coexist in the identity. Otherwise, there would be no bridge. Exactly right. And it's exactly that emotive bridge that links sagehood and sainthood also. It's just that the uh, emotivity that links personhood and sagehood is more localized uh, in, in the present life. Not, ex not always, but more. And uh, the one uh, that links the emotivity from sagehood to sainthood is more of existential uh, level emotivity. Um, there's where our terrors of um, not being and non-being kick in. So um, in these senses, in, in, in all these domains, um, we're, when we over emotionally overattach or emotionally overattach to resist, uh, you can emotionally overattach to attachment or overly over or overattach emotionally to resistance. Um, resistance is also emotionally driven. Um, and so that's all our wounds that either need to resist or get married instead of just dating resistance. <laughs> we get married to resistance and we get married to attachment instead of just dating it. We can't help but attach to what we like and, and resist what we don't like. That's fine. It's all a matter of degree, though, in, in, in identity, not structural, not structural. In other words, it's just a just, it's just a, de a degree that we're over attached or over resisting. That's the problem, not attachment uh, or resistance in the first place. Uh, you, you see the difference there. Uh, attachment, uh, attachment, and over identification are not intrinsically bad. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Uh -huh. What Say I'm more saying. About that. Yeah, it's um, it's about it's about how sober our consciousness is, is rendered or not rendered by the lack of healing our personhood before we ever get into a sagehood path. In other words, in the same way that um, uh, the I was created by a uh, cathection of dualistic experience um, doesn't mean that I is an illusion. Just because we overattach doesn't mean that overattachment itself is a, is the structural problem. It's ah, just okay. Really, so it, it's it's problematic, but not necessarily the intrinsic structural issue. Yeah. Necess what's was necessary but not sufficient. Um, that's another way of uh, yeah. doing that. Well, that's related that, to the, there's a third thing there that that I saw because without that distinction, then people can become over uh, attached to unattachment. Correct. Right. Absolutely right. That is the mechanism of overattachment to non-attachment. Yeah. Is that uh, when they feel it's structural, then they've got nowhere to go, but then also uh, go that route. But even many uh, gurus on their track or, or enlightened teachers and leaders don't get how much they're overattached to non-attachment. And that creates a transcendent relationship to waking up versus a healing fear relationship to waking up, which is a distinction to that big enough to, as you would say, to drive a paradigm. <laughs> Absolutely right. Uh, that's why the the um, the recalibration of the non-dual to pre-dual, rather than the um, default kind of way non-duality is held is as trans-dual, trans-dual. Mm -hmm. uh, if you reframe it pre-dual, that it, that the um, the not the um, abiding uh, no thingness um, uh, advaya of um, uh, uh, of of uh, enlightenment uh, is is something out of which everything arises. All duality and distinctionability arises. If you look at the non-dual as pre-dual, uh, nowadays that when I'm helping people do this, I ask them, you know, no, don't just watch what arises. Focus on what 
what it's arising out of. Right. Yes. More contextual. Yeah. I run into the same thing with people. You, it, when you focus it that way, you don't get lost in tracking, which can hit a hit a hit an, uh, a status quo, a stasis that's just you know can last for years. Yeah. Um, and mem- remember, they say ar- arise um, uh, um, uh, uh, and and dissipate. The dissipation is trans based. See, trans based. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So that's exactly why what you just said has become the default. Um, meta orientation of most um, non-dual teachings is the dissipative or the transcendent version of of where all duality goes to die. Identity says, "Whoa, hold your not horses." Um, uh, well, we want to focus on what does duality arise out of, and since um, the, their metaphysics of the, of the 2400 or 2464 um, uh, amount of uh, a teaching out there, both from Hindu and Buddhist sources, um, w- w- since the, this is no thing, um, there's nothing to really um, look at there, um, what duality arises out of, because it's insubstantial, um, tabula rasa, um, featureless, contentless. So there's no reason to look there. But if you, and since it will just let it dissipate, let it transcend itself, let it um, by the fo- holding the meditative focus. See, but let that it will tra- transcend, it will transcend slash avoid entirely the terror of not being that way. Which, upon which identity's sagehood path is based. All right. So I, this is, I can already imagine we're like 20 minutes in and this is extremely <laughs> intense, uh, difficult <laughs> transcendental metaphysics for people to follow. So uh, in you know, with a multi-purpose in mind, uh, I would like to offer myself as a case study related to this because it just hit me that the awakening type thing, or you call it once an illumination that I had three years ago, mm-hmm. I'm seeing now um, was limited because it there was a transcendent dynamic and it stopped short of fully processing the terror of not being. Yes. I was experiencing the terror of not being, but I didn't get all the way through it. So I ended up with a transcendent awakening, not a healed fear of being awakening, which yes. was on the way, but not complete. Oh, so clearly said, uh, Joseph. And, and that's so that's so right. Um, you uh, when you try when it's based on a transcendent view, um, this is why that became the default meta orientation is because no one ever defined the primacy of consciousness as emotive. Mm-hmm. Once you, once you um, uh, look at what look for a long time at what uh, thoughts uh, and arising dualisms in your head or whatever arise out of, you'll find that it's not a no thing. It's featureless <laughs> and it's contentless, but it has a being a being to it that is indescribable, but experienceable. So um, what your illumination did, uh, it was just like you said, based in Zen, which is uh, um, completely transcendent based, um, even cleaner in some ways than than Advaita Vedanta, because it's the esoteric form of Hinduism. And Hinduism has all sorts of um, colors and textures and complexities to it. Whereas Zen is the black and white ultimate um, track, um, but it's based in transcendence. Mm-hmm. So um, by focusing on what what over time inside of an emotional, emotive first basis of consciousness, what they didn't, if they try to look at the pre-dual space out of which all dualism arises in the head, for example, um, they wouldn't find anything because they're looking for substantiveness. They're looking for structural kinds of dynamics or the lack thereof. When when identity when identity does it, what does it feel like? What does it feel like? The dualisms are coming out when you take that track based on emotivity as our essence of consciousness. You will begin to sense the being out of which duality arises which is very different being uh, more in the direction of what Advaita Vedanta says, but then even uh, parts with that uh, way down line uh, uh, goes another whole direction with that divine being that you can sense. So, so uh, uh, how do I say this? I've heard um, 
Ajashanti has talks about the the terror of not being. He wouldn't use that term exactly, but he talks about the that fear of um, coming up. But it it. But I heard him once say that like some people have to feel that and some don't, and mm -hmm. the the I think the orientation that is really important is well just that it's like it may arise, it may not arise. If it does arise, then you know just be with that. But we would take a very different, like far more proactive, investigative and emotively engaged version of that. Like, no, that terror of not being needs to be reveled in, needs to be allow it to yes. consume you. And yes. then my second my second point is a question. Does that need to be felt in the presence of another as in personhood? Because in personhood, we would say the wounds, the childhood wounds are. Uh, formed in relationship, so they have to be healed in relationship. Does the terror of not being also have to be experienced with another? It's a really great question. Um, uh, I revel in uh, the, the, every time I open the hole in my face or my hole in my face opens on its own. <laughs> um, uh, I want to be asked a question I've never been asked before. And this <laughs> question has never been asked. Yay! Before, right? <laughs> cool. So um, the answer is um, it depends, uh -huh. uh, our, because our picture of yeah our picture of things is that um, y um, young young adult teen teenage level souls, which means just number of incarnations. That's all, just the number of incarnations, and young adult um, uh, the the number of incarnations. They they, they tend not often to feel that um, terror of not being because the place their consciousness is in maturing in its arc of incarnation in this most dense Terranic universe, we call it matter, matter, energy, dark energy, and dark matter, uh, and gravity, of course. Um, uh, uh, once you're around the block more than 350 or 380 lifetimes, um, you do begin to feel this default terror and old, these older souls, more incarnations, not more worth, not better, just more incarnations. Mm -hmm. When they've encountered gurus who were had attained satori uh, or, or samadhi, um, and uh, but were younger souls based on a transcendence algorithm that didn't include emotions, because emotions are just as much dualistically myic as thoughts. They're just a softer form, but a trickier form from, from the standard uh, protocol uh, metaphysics of the East that has survived to this day. Emotions are equivalent to thoughts. Uh, you don't attach to those. You don't resist them. Subset of but, mind, right? Exactly right. Just a subset of mind. And, and as you just said, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, over-attachment to non-attachment comes out of that. But the deal here is, is just what you said, um, uh, does it have? Does that terror of not being have to be um, uh, land in an other because it was created in an other? Well, it will come up uh, in uh, uh, in older souls, but it doesn't necessarily have to land in a in a guru or a, a, an enlightened um, facilitator mm -hmm. um, because the original terror of not being was a separation from our ontogeny not a person yeah it's not personal in nature it's not nature. exactly right yet and, and i want to be careful on this track because one of the things that identity takes strong issue with in adi das teaching is that he of course held that you required the presence of an enlightened field of a of a master oh dear um either baked in it so in your little room uh, after the last teaching or satsang um, you pop that is all because you've been in the the, the, the field dynamics of an enlightened guru um, and so for me to say that um, it's it's actually helpful and positive if it is received by a like-hearted like and sold being just because that's true doesn't mean it's required Mm -hmm. uh, another sufficient, necessary, but sufficient, but not necessary, mm -hmm. you see? Mm -hmm. So um, the answer to your wonderful new question mm -hmm. is, yeah, it's a gift if that happens. Yeah. But but if you're on a track with a, 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 a an enlightenment facilitation track, which I want to talk a little bit more, like I said, at the end here, um, uh, where that happens, um, uh, you're... you're if you experience it start to consume you, this terror of not being, 
which we invite you to do because you've created enough emotive self-center to allow yourself to go to the death of yourself. That's another really important felt reality. That's why personhood should, needs to proceed to some degree, sagehood path, because you've got to have a, an emotive based center to be able to emotively stand and be able to let that terror of not being consume you. Right? Yeah, and if you can't handle uh, you know, moment to moment uh, situational anxiety, you're not gonna be able to tolerate the terror of not being, for example. Exactly right. So, um, and again, uh, when we identity has a whole different metaphysical basis for healing the emotive essential the wounded uh, the woundedness of our emotional so emoto soulful essentiality I let this uh, hole in my face um, uh, take a, a moment while I lick my lips here <laughs> moisten it um, when 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 that when that happens um, uh, the uh, the uh, sagehood facilitator would would remind the person that um, uh, who so would support that reveling as you said let that just burn you up that terror let that terror replace or be bigger than the I that doesn't want to feel it mm -hmm. right? and that's the algorithm of uh, mental body and soulment our version of what's been called enlightenment. When I want to insert something here, it's just an enormous problem uh, occurred to me is that there must be in many cases in the world a um, enlightened teacher who, because of their soul age, has not had to go through the terror of not being, but mm -hmm. had the Satori anyway. And they've got mm -hmm. students who are older of soul and yes. must feel the terror of not being. Yes. And there's not sufficient guidance there because the teacher is going to say, oh, yeah, if that just comes up, then, you know, just allow that to be. But that's right. not going to be enough for that student who really needs yeah. help to steer directly into it in an emotive way, not just an energetic acknowledgement way. Oh, Joseph, um, that's the story of uh, 30 years of my teaching. Yeah. Um, I've drawn people who are older souls yeah. who have had that kind of experience either in the present life or in, in previous lives and have come to finally heal it this lifetime. Uh, I've, I've worked with students from, um, from Osho, from Ma the Maharishi and from Adi Da, all who had that emotive thing come up as we're talking and were either directly or indirectly shamed um, that they're over attached to their I based emotional states. Ah, right. Because that fear would be seen as a subset of mind. Exactly. Needing to be transcended rather than right. actually the governing dynamic of the path to the deepest enlightenment that we're talking about here. Exactly right. Wow. And that's the tragedy that, in, in the same way in other domains where I've um, attract identity has attracted. Um, People who have been just um, massacred by uh, uh, Catholicism, I call it, um, uh, uh, just massacred by it. Um, I've drawn people uh, who, who've done Eastern practice, that's Western religion, um, Eastern practice who've been massacred by this kind of either passive or active abuse. Um, it's a neg it's a neg when the per when the teacher is sort of a benign um, neutral kind of person, uh, it's begin it's neglect when this is not attended to in an older soul. But when 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 you're shamed actively uh, for it by being over attached or why are you at this stage still attached to this? This is crazy. You're, and you get criticized or you, you're shown in front of everyone to be um, uh, um, to be behind the uh, behind the curve, as it were. Um, mm -hmm. It's just outright abuse. And now they have to repress that fear, which yeah. actually should be embraced and encouraged up. And now they got to push it down. And that exactly. becomes a knot that they have to outwork. Mm -hmm. I, I I could um, enlightenedly, enlightenedly sure. uh, uh, um, work with a, a teen soul, a younger soul in their late 200s or middle up to 350 lifetimes and, and, and tutor them through uh, uh, their version that does not necessitate an emo uh, a terror of not being um, 
it wouldn't come up as much, or if it came up a little, I'd support it to the degree they can. And at that at that le- um, younger level, that might be enough to pop, mm-hmm. pop the, um, the the bubble, as it were. So uh, that's another way to say um, about uh, the sagehood path and identity being inclus- inclusive to all soul ages. You won't get uh, uh, young souls uh, interested in the East, um, but you will get uh, teenage souls um, and uh, young adult souls between 250 and 350 lifetimes uh, interested in the East, Eastern teachings. And so uh, it includes all, all soul ages to the degree that they're really interested in, um, even if it's just structural Satori in the old track, I can help them do. I, I did it in the old track with profoundly different results though. Um, in my track, which was the Pure Zen track, um, I found the um, terror of, of not being coming up so strongly that I brought it to my teacher and he benign, lovely guy that he was, um, didn't support it, of course, as well, that's just more Maya, um, watch mm-hmm. it until it dissipates, just watch it until it dissipates, only it, it got worse and worse and worse, the more I meditated upon it or watched it or became mindful of it. Um, and so it got so bad that I think I mentioned before my meditation bench uh, was uh, became a torture uh, device mm-hmm. for me. Uh, I, I, I looked at it all day long and in, in dread to go do do my sitting, you know. Um, so mine exploded. I, 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 I it was uh, it, it set me afire, and um, I couldn't I couldn't put the fire out. The pain, uh, the terror was so big, and that's what put me over the um, uh, through the eye of the needle, as it were. So it's a really good point. Um, it's not uh, um, necessary to mental body and soul, um, but it's it's um, sufficient. Uh, uh, this ter- processing the terror of not being. And I also wanted to say there's an important context here that I think is not usually appreciated because there's so much Zen sort of grafted into New Age spirituality, and there's a lot of uh, Eastern Dharma that has trickled into semi-mainstream consciousness here and a lot of assumptions that people make, you know, with like the phrase when people say, oh, just let it go, you know, Mm -hmm. about whatever it is. They don't necessarily realize that that's, you know, firmly rooted in Buddhism and that's an idea that is 2,500 years old and what is appropriate to let go and what not and what (laughs) does that actually mean and can you really do it and all of that. Um, And that we have, I think I said this in a previous podcast about how, um, enamored the West is with the East because we didn't grow up with the conditioning of it. The same way in the East, they think right. Christianity and Judaism is really cool uh, yeah. because they didn't grow up with it. <laughs> and they're not. So we, in the 60s and 70s, the East came here through people like Alan Watts and, and other sure. entertaining people like that. And uh, what's his name? Uh, Suzuki. And yeah. um, there's this idea of like, oh, well, because this wasn't just a distorted part of my childhood conditioning, that it must be some squeaky clean, perfect paradigm. And yeah. so I'm going to dive into that. And I think <laughs> a, a lot of people are hitting the limits of that and finding those distortions. And that's where yeah. I think identity can really help people see where they've hit limits like I have. Yeah, it's um, and again, we identity m- not magically draws uh, people who hit their Peter principle in this way, and they and if they're if it, if they have the capacity to get past that Peter principle, they'll be drawn to identity. They will find it. They will find it. They sniff it out in unconscious, soulful ways and find identity to help them sort it through. So um, I loved your personal um, story there, Joseph, because again, it brings the rubber to the uh, to the road here. Um, what what it really means to um, redefine or recalibrate um, what non-dual enlightenment is um, and what it entails. In this way, um, the Buddha's um, uh, uh, original assessment of the middle way, don't attach, don't resist, against the Hindi Hindi ascetics, Hindu ascetics, who were resisting hunger and were resisting bathing and resisting um, Mm. uh, thinking, uh, right? Attachment Uh, is not attachment. Attachment to non-attachment. Which becomes its own state, which then the whole point was to not be attached to any state. But, you know, yes. it's it's so funny because that happens, you know, everything everything that replaces the old thing becomes yes. a new version of the old thing. That's just what humans do. Especially when 
we're still we try to do tr change or transmutation or tran or transformation um, uh, using the same definition of consciousness that the previous generation of thought uh, yeah. utilized. And here's where, of course, Albert um, Albert E said you can't solve a problem at the same level the problem was um, instigated. Mm -hmm. You can't use well, we're mental body. Our eye is a mentally a, a mental um, ephemera created by dualistic experience, uh, or it's just a way neurons put together a, a quantum a quantum array of um, of iness uh, that results in an iness. If you go with the body creates consciousness or dualistic experience creates personal consciousness, either one you're going to just fold over all the errors into the new version, uh, <laughs> you, as you just yeah. said. See, So it's only by rocking the whole, not just rocking the boat, but torpedo, torpedoing the boat, mm. that the eye is either created by brain tissue or by simply by cathection uh, to um, dualistic experience. We have to torpedo both those boats, sink mm. them all together if you want to get past your Peter principle of, and avoid folding over, attach, uh, oh yes, I'm going to go into the forest and not eat and not bathe for a year and grow my beard down to my toes. Um, and um, all my teeth will fall out because of vitamin C deficiency, but I'm on the road to enlightenment. Uh, uh, you're attached to non-attachment and you won't know that you are uh, because it's still dualism. Um, uh, mm. uh, uh, and uh, and there, is a, there is a necessary, I want to say two things. One is it seems like there is a, a necessity to uh, what I would call the seeker, you know, that the, the, the seeker is attached to the outcome of enlightenment. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a sufficient uh, pursuit. But at yes. a certain point, that has to go because the, the seeker is too much of a noun to, um, to try to yeah. persist past that yeah. and the other thing i wanted to say just uh, another personal offering here is the to, to me this the uh, the powerful proof in what we're talking about has been for me that um since uh since returning to the personal about a year <laughs> and a half ago and and doing uh uh insolment work uh with with brie your wife uh, where i ended up a couple of years ago after all of the illumination stuff sort of went as far as it would it's all mm -hmm. coming back and it seems like it's the uh, emotional personal work has mm -hmm. gone put me right back to where i ended up and stopped before and send me sending me forward with no meditation yeah. no radical self-inquiry no intention yes. for that to happen whatsoever <laughs> it, it seems very clear that like the 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 wall that i ran into which we would theorize as being um, personal emotional stuff by addressing yes. that the, that uh, that that log jam un unjammed and now it's proceeding on its own accord and i know we've seen that with other people too and wonderful so clear what you say and and the the algorithm that makes what you just said possible is that everything you did was substantive and real. Mm. It just because you hit a, a Peter principle on it doesn't mean how you got to the Peter principle was off path. Oh, yeah, you see, sure. it yeah. just it just hit, it couldn't go any further till the emotive unconscious emotive blockages in person your personal and all of our personal beings um, are somehow emotively uh, healed. I, I had to do the exact opposite. I, I, I did, I did, I think I had three therapy sessions in my twenties and thirties, uh, um, which only lasted one or two sessions each, uh, trying to work with my, uh, what I knew was my wounded, um, um, persona from childhood. Um, but when, when, and this is a really important too, was when a, a really deep form of enlightenment, even the old version that I, that I did, um, uh, in the, still in the young tradition, of a transcendence. Um, uh, I, I, my, my own uh, terror of not being happened in spite of that, not because of that transcendence path. Yeah. It happened in spite of it, right? Well, you and just so, said something very casual there that's important, that uh, transcendence is a yang-based dynamic. I don't remember oh. hearing that before. Oh, yes. Whereas healing um, the fear in, is inclusive, inclu allowing that to be and, and, yes. and wanting to proactively feel it. That would be a yin dynamic. Yeah, I've heard I've heard when a few um, teachers, um, uh, 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 I've heard a few, one or two 
maybe two or three, um, describe transcendence with a yin or a yang kind of uh, um, uh, um, uh, tincture, as it were. Mm -hmm. It's always yin because yeah. you're disappearing, right? It, it appears yin <laughs> on the outside. Just, you know, let it go. But yes, it, no, oh, it's, it's not. So, yeah. It's a um, that that is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Mm -hmm. um, that that teaching and uh, uh, the yangic transcendence is yang or transcendence as the algorithm for enlightenment is yangic because you're using personal will to try to dismantle the personal attachments. Wait, what? Wait, what? Yeah, it's uh, sort of like open. You can grip your fist. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But opening your hand and letting go, you're still using muscles to do that. Exactly. Uh -huh. Exactly. Uh, the, another good metaphor for that is um, when you're trying to loosen a nail from a wall, you know, this one. You a have screw, to, you mean? A screw, a screw, yeah. yeah. You have to push mm -hmm. to release it, mm -hmm. uh, right? That that push is the, is the will thing, uh, right? Mm -hmm. And that can work right up to a certain point uh, for younger souls, but it will not work for older souls. So again, there's no judgment in any, any of this, only discernment um, about why and what some versions of consciousness um, top out at the transcendental, with the transcendental algorithm as, you're, as you did, Joseph. Um, and and, and uh, uh, instead of the uh, deeper actual algorithm, which is the um, healing of the terror of not being mm -hmm. all inside the redefinition. Mm -hmm. One other uh, dimension of, of this exact track that you're talking about here in willfulness that we just touched on. Uh, so often the traditions out there that's, that infect New Age teaching too um, uh, um, really excoriate desire. Mm -hmm. uh, desire is mm -hmm. the problem, right? Um, because they'll define desire as the generator of attachment. So um, they'll talk, some, some teachers will talk more about stop detaching, be mindful, which technically should be saying be mindless. You know, I know, I never mindful. got that mindful word. Why they mindful. use that word doesn't make any oh, that's, sense. That's, it just drives me out of my yeah. mind that I don't have in that <laughs> out way. Out of your mindfulness. <laughs> yes, right. Uh, and so, um, uh, wait, I just lost the uh, track. We're we talking uh, about got, desire defined as the oh, generator yeah, of attachment. Yes, uh, it's not, a, identity would say the problem's not desire. Uh, uh, desire doesn't generate attachment. Wound-based desire generates over-attachment. Yeah, you say that to someone 2,500 years ago. What do you mean, like a war wound? <laughs> they would have no <laughs> concept. Did someone that. stick you, stick me in my buttocks with a spear? You know, <laughs> is that what you mean? Um, so yeah, uh, only wounds, unconscious emotional body wounds creates desire to over attach. Uh, when you heal the basis for your desires, you can desire. I, I like a, um, a, 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 a shredded chicken quesadilla uh, far more than I do a piece of slab of, uh, of, of chicken muscle in my uh, quesadilla. Well, you must uh, not be enlightened then because it's oh, too strong I, I a preference. Be, yeah. <laughs> no, that's right. Uh, and, and again, again, desire or preference, that's the, the, the little lighter form. Uh, that, yeah. That's desire light is preference, right? Uh, desire light. <laughs> you, you, to, to, have, to, to have preferences is to be unenlightened. I've heard mm. actually someone say that once, um, mm. uh, have any preferences at all. So that's why um, they go so blanco um, in everyday life, and the, in these uh, a lot of these people who do attain satori, quote unquote, in that crack, are so color colorless um, and so um, just um, benignly, um, uh, well, like uh, ET uh, who uh, um, has the Spielberg that ET. Sorry, the Spielberg ET. No, the um, Eckhart Tolle. ET. Oh. <laughs> It's like what? <laughs> uh, wow! This um, I look at him and I and I get the same quiver of soul as I do when I look at the Zuck. You know, um, the two Mark of them. Zuckerberg. Yeah, I have the same sort of whoa, dude, wait, what? Um, and this is why when heart. people take that paradigm to its logical conclusion, they seem so impersonal and yes. and not alive. Um, but yeah. which is not what the reports were of Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha. He no. was. 
very, very alive and warm. Yeah. And I, I had the same ex- experience, not to m- compare myself, but um, I had a, I've had a similar re- uh, a reaction to me, to my, to um, teaching over the last 30 years or so, 25, 28, 30 years. Um, I'm not recognized as uh, enlightened because I'm too warmly human. Um, I'm not detached. Um, I don't walk around uh, 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 in guru clothing. Um, um, I dress basically sportive. Um, and so uh, what, uh, not recognized because my, my form of enlightenment was an ensoulment and the parameters and uh, to be able to discern that would require that the observer or someone who's listening to me have gotten a certain way f- along that emotive path to recognize, wait, this guy, he, he does know what he's talking about. I just don't get that credit up front. Um, and so, well, the uh, conditioning, that, it's remarkable. The conditioning about yes. what enlightenment is, is so deep, you know, and, and I, I, I remember um, back in the day, one of your favorite questions was what is the point of an, what is the point of meditation and what is enlightenment to groups of people? And I've done that myself. And even people who haven't read any mm-hmm. books or anything, it's amazing what they will say because it's all, they're all speaking to the transcendent version of it. Yes. And so they see someone who is like above it all and doesn't have many personal interests and they go, oh, that person must be enlightened, which yeah. is an un- unconscious uh, desire to really not be alive and not have to participate as a human being in reality. Exactly uh, right. And um, that's just such a tragedy. Well, it's there's a there's a global like the trade winds that go around the earth at the equator um, uh, and go in opposite directions in the upper and lower hemisphere, etc. Uh, the world's uh, global consciousness, just like uh, Catholicism is represents a great, even though there are good things to all religions, of course, there are as a good side to it. Uh, the toxicities in, in Catholic Catholicism uh, have been baking for a thousand years or longer, uh, um, um, uh, 1500 years. Yeah, it's uh, the same as it's better to give than to receive. It's the same kind absolutely. of things that persist. Mm-hmm. So even if they, like you just said, they don't do a lot of reading, it's in the system, it's in the global consciousness, mm-hmm. the transcendent version, and identities uh, turning everything upside down and saying, no, it's a prescendent pre-ascendant um uh pre-ascendant um algorithm not transcendent uh the pre-ascendant gets all the job gets the job done without any of the downsides of the transcendent um uh and so yeah, you once said uh healing creates a natural transcendence but transcendence does not create a natural heal- healing exactly right uh there, there's a even boy i like that guy who said that uh, <laughs> that was you so, nine yeah but, i know but that's what the, you remind me because um when I said I want to just finish a sentence I said 15 minutes ago, um, I mm-hmm. had the opposite as your experience, where uh, uh, the the um, you had did personal work for a while, and then there was a rupture with that, duly noted, um, <laughs> and uh, then you took the other track uh, in a couple of different dimensions of transcendence um, mm-hmm. out of the personal, um, and then f- rediscovered the personal from a new basis, having aerated a lot of your consciousness authentically yeah it got me out of my mind which seemed to be quite critical Mm. (laughs) to find your soul i get and heart yeah Yeah, Mm. so right yeah but but i had the exact opposite um when you had an event like i had it seals off it literally it cuts off access to the personal Mm-hmm. I had to fight my way back to the personal to even get a modicum of working on my bloody wounds. That's why I've had such a disasters happen to me in teaching my teaching authority is because my own unattended um, uh, a personal being uh, undermined my teaching authority as a spiritual educator or a teacher. And uh, that that's exactly what um, uh, caused those things. And, and, there's no excuse, just an explanation that when you have a, a really um, a, an austere a Zen-based enlightenment that's, that was literally tabula rasa for weeks and a, a month or two afterward, you, your access to actually get to the personal, to do the bloody personal work is rendered almost impossible. So I needed chaos and failure, chaos and failure, failure and chaos. To, to steer me back around to it, just yeah. to steer me back around. So all the things that um, I, I I can I have such regret and remorse over 
is all because I was cut off, not all. There was other dimensions yeah. too. I cut off from my personal. Um, and so judge me if you like, that's fine. I stick with what you feel, whatever you've had experience of me in that old way, that's fine. Um, just know that um, tr try getting back to the personal and look at your own personal stuff when the personal is just, it's not gone, it's just unfindable. Yeah, and, uh, and you, I'd heard, I've heard you talk about that before I went on my uh, Zen journey, and I have a much greater appreciation for it now. There's really no conceiving of it because if I had gone all the way, I don't think I would have had the ability to to come back to per the personal, I, and and uh, you know the the strength of soul and spine that you have. Um, I would say is is observably greater than mine. One and two. Even then, even with that, you had to endure some serious personal tragedy to steer you back to to look in, inside yourself. It wasn't just like okay, well, I'll just decide to do this. Life had to sort of cram you into the box to do it. And exactly right. I, uh, fail. I, yeah. Fail again. Fail better. Yeah. Right? Only crisis. Um, uh, um, in three or four uh, seminal moments in my teaching authority uh, uh, got me finally onto the track and then meeting my mate uh, was the icing on that cake, of course. But well, the, the point- meeting, meeting my mate was one of the things that crammed me back into the box. I don't think it would have happened without that, for sure. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah we don't want to, right, right. Uh, there are some moments where w without your, uh, 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 your a real mate, a real soulmate that you call to you, which is a, train wreck made in heaven as yeah we like which almost it. exploded many many times that was my version of that of just because sure. for me i wanted to insert this to sort of complete my story is um uh what i've discovered and am discovering i think i think i'm over a, a hump now um with it is that it was um, some very subtle unconscious control where i had a um an inner monk that a wound-based inner monk that was using the uh, Zen path as a way of relating to reality. Um, that it, it, and as long as that's there, you're not going to be healing the fear of the terror of not being. He was never interested in that, even though <laughs> yes. I mentally knew that he was. Right. He wanted to transcend, and so I did. And that's yeah. exactly why I stopped. He stopped it. I think he he made sure I got eighty percent of the way and just stopped. And now right. that he's outworked and there's more me differentiated from him, the train is going down the hill and he's like, oh, shit, this is exactly what I did not want to happen. But it's, of course, what I do want. Yeah. And that and that's the distinction between a transcendence based um, track and a emotional based track is yeah. it exposes the self imagery mm -hmm. that um, that so many Westerners have whether they're in a mall yoga yoga class at the at the mall um, uh, or or they are um, they're they fancy themselves as seekers in the non-dual path uh, yeah. it's a self image that's seeking so uh, it's what you said before uh, the seeker at one point is an albatross around the neck um, yeah. of our liberated uh, eventuality and uh, and but we, I want to stress here that you can't kill the seeker, you thin it out long enough, you thin, a, thin it out long enough where the pre-dual uh, uh, breaks the dam of your over-attachment to the uh, mental body I and uh, floods you and finds you and that's the end of the seeker. The end of the seeker isn't a choice. Um, mm. It's a what they call in the past, oh, well, it's grace when it finds you, you know. Mm -hmm. it, uh, we have a little a deeper, more emotional um, picture of what actually finds you uh, in that. We've talked about it in other podcasts. Uh, it's the uh, it's the womb of yin divinity, uh, which we talked about a lot. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that yep. uh, today. But the point here, I'd like to uh, end uh, close up here with a, a couple of things. Um, uh, when any, I'd like to let people get a flavor or a taste of the kinds of shifts of consciousness that personally happen on your track in uh, in uh, identities pre-dual based in uh, in Solomon track. There's um there's a uh, um, when you're real when you finally break through or when the pre-dual breaks through your over attachment to your mind based I, you, you go there's a phase there are phases that leads up to that. The first phase is your normal consciousness, 
um, that we all start with, uh, this I, this the central kind of arbiter of our world. Um, in that state, you could say that state dependent uh, place, I am I, and that is that. That's where we all st start. I am I, and that over there is that. As you, as you go a little further in the identities track, it becomes a uh, change from changes from I am I and that is that to that and I is only I. That's the second stage. That and I is only I. In other words, everything I experience, I experience inside of me. Mm -hmm. and that's the second stage. The third one is um, you move from that and I is only I to that and I is only that. Uh, <laughs> That, that's the, the stage that you're now you're starting to get close, right? Uh, as you break through, as that breaks through, the next um, uh, experience is not I and not that I is. Not I and not that is. That's the moment where you register nothing, uh, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Not I and not that is. Is. Mm -hmm. Is, right? And the last one is as you after you break through an identity's version of prescendent um, sage work, I is, and I isn't, and that is, and that isn't. Nice. Mm -hmm. That's that. That those are the five experiences. And when those five experiences start to really digest in, you've got five consciousness orientations that come out of it. And this is after the ensoulment. Um, you have openness without hope. You have choice without expectation. You have action without impulse. You have direction without compass. And you have life without center. Mm, because the centers are everywhere. Yes, exactly right. Um, and so those, that's how it all integrates. Those are the kind of stages we go through. And um, those are milestones. Uh, uh, um, when I help people go through um, uh, um, a, um, uh, a personal ensoulment path to the pre-dual, those are the markers that we're orienting all of our work around. What's going on? What's going on? Are you, oh, you're still in that and I. A lot of people don't even get that and I is only I, that everything we experience is inside of us. This is a completely new thing for most people on the planet most not all of course so the point of all this is that um oh how can i say it there's a great metaphor here joseph um uh there's a lot of noise out there uh in enlightenment land uh, uh with every all, all, every variation imaginable that's out there there's a lot of noise um but like engineers or the military uh, uh, might use um, identities always looking for the signal inside the noise. Mm. It's always looking for that one real dynamical bandwidth of consciousness and being that's subsumed inside all the noise. And, and to, that's a discernment, discerning the signal um, uh, amid the noise in personhood is seeing everything is emotional um, uh, uh, and, not, and not just conceptual and physical, uh, and that our unconscious, the unconscious signals are all in the noise of the conscious. We're looking for the unconscious signals uh, in our personal work that drive our uh, intentions, actions, and outcomes. We're looking for the signal, the pre-dual signal uh, inside the noise of the transcendent um, uh, algorithm, right? And for the um, for sainthood, we're looking for the signal and all the the real signal and all the noise around the the, the descriptions and and teachings of a jealous and angry God uh, um, that gives you only one lifetime to uh, live and learn everything and make a, and if you don't <laughs> do it right, you what you a go bad to deal hell. that would be. Yeah. Oh my God! As if that a God of love would. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Looking for the signal um, uh, inside of all the noise, uh, identity's um, picture of sagehood, like personhood and sainthood, um, really goes to the heart of the pre-dual nature of yin divinity, divinity, that all of creation is, 
is arising out of now and now and now and now and enlightenment, what which we call ensoulment, and mo- mental body ensoulment, because it dethrones the mind eye, is um, uh, the moments of the um, empty space of the yin divinity's womb prior to our soul birth. And that's a fractal, uh, a deeper fractal of our soul birth that we reboot within when we have Satori in identities, uh, a version of uh, enlightenment practice. Our soul, we, as we said before, the moments before our soul was actually arose out of divine being, cl- is cl- there's a bit of that pre, pre, pre existence that um, hovers around the roots of our soul being. And that's why it's so hard to get back to those roots and find the, the pre dual because it's, it's way below, it's, you've got local, then you've got existential, and then you've got pre-existential. Uh, and that's the zone that identity sagehood path, um, it looks for as the signal and all the noise going on in East and West on what it means to be enlightened. Wow. Okay, well, um, I think that's a good place to close. I also think we've got more to say about this maybe in the next podcast. Um, let, let's, um, yeah, there, that we, we've hit, we, we hit high points in other podcasts. We hit middle points in this one. <laughs> let's, let's go one step deeper and get a little finer mesh, uh, mm-hmm. a lens to talk about the, maybe the experience of it more personally. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I'd love to do that. Does that, that make sense to you? Yeah. Let's, let's do one more. Uh, it, it warrants it, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, Stace. This has been haha enlightening. I can't believe I said <laughs> that. I'm embarrassed that I said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I guess it was right there. It was pre-existentially uh, enlightening. <laughs> um, oh, reasonable. Yeah. Oh, oh can, can I add one other closing? I just, just rose up. Um, you know, um, not many people know he's back from the 60s and 70s. He died in 1990, I think. Norman Cousins was a political analyst and uh, ambassador of sorts. He brokered the deal for the Test Ban Treaty uh, through the United Nations and mm-hmm. the Vatican between Russia and the United States at the time. And he said something here that, oh, I, I, I read recently that is so Edenic. edenic. Mm-hmm. He said, death is not the greatest loss in life. The greatest loss is what is what dies inside us while we live. Let me wow. say that again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What, death is not the greatest loss in life. The greatest loss is what dies inside us while we live. Right. And since this is um, what we've been talking about, which we will get into a little more next time. And a sort of an ego death. We didn't use the word ego. I want I had a goal this 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 podcast not to have ego anywhere in there. And here I name it the bloody end. Yeah. But we'll talk about it, uh, an ego death that also applies here. What is lost inside us when we don't um, enlighten uh, our actual root of soul birth? It never comes to our consciousness. Mm. Uh, so mm-hmm. that applies in personhood, sagehood, and sainthood, that beautiful, amazing phrase by Norman Cousins. Um, and uh, what dies inside us, of course, is our authentic self mm-hmm. in, uh, uh, in personhood. Our soul self's birth is, dies inside us while we live in sagehood, if we don't do sagehood. And if we don't do uh, sainthood based in emotive um, primacy, then our relationship with divinity remain must remain a belief rather than a direct experience mm-hmm. and that dies inside us uh, if we don't uh, discover that so okay. yeah that's where we'll go next deeper into that all kind right of stuff. thanks so much joseph and again thanks for your personal reveal yeah. and it's always um so rich when you do that thank you're you you're so welcome and thank you stace thank you all for listening and we hope you'll tune in next time bye for now Thanks for listening to the Heart of Soul podcast. To learn more about Stace Barron and Identity, please visit identity.org. To learn more about Joseph Shapiro, visit clearandopen.com. Until next time, we wish you well on your journey.